We're now going to introduce our first speaker for Megalithomania 2023. And this is a gentleman who actually spoke, strangely, 10 years ago at the Megalithomania to the day, virtually, um, at when we were at the assembly rooms. And he's a co-author uh, of various very influential books, The Spine of Albion, The Power of Center, and the subject is going to focus on today called the, the book is called The Spirit of Portland. Please give a warm welcome to Gary Billcliffe. Good morning, everyone. And a big warm good morning to all you megalithomaniacs. I feel your pain. I really do. It's a lonely life for a megalith lover. Um, but we observe things other people don't, and we sense things other people don't. And being around megaliths kind of heightens the senses, I find. And that's been my story. And, of course, following lines of energy, as you know, from the Spine of Albion, which was initiated by the great John Michel uh, in New View over Atlantis, probably the most influential book ever. So, this morning, I'm going to take you down to the seaside, just nine miles, ten miles, no, actually 50 miles south of here, on the Isle of Portland. I'm sure many of you have been to the Isle of Portland, yes? And those who haven't, well, you'll find it a mysterious place. Um, it's a bit like Marmite to the stranger. It, um, it's a rocky paradise for some um, and a bombed out sort of landscape for others. But, um, it has an air of mystery to it that I'm going to explore with you this morning. Starting with one of the first things I observed on Portland was some of the massive stone walls in the Cyclopean sort of fashion of the Greeks and the Etruscans and, um, <clears throat> and the Egyptians. But um, unfortunately, they weren't ancient. They were made in the 19th century. And I, I observe that this is quite unusual because in all the places I've visited around the country, I've never seen people recreating great cy cyclopean walls in the 19th century. And so I got, uh, the more I researched Portland, the more I realized there's a legacy here of, of stone masonry going right back to the Phoenicians um, who were able to lift cut and move massive stones. There's a lot of these massive stones around Portland that we can look at on Wednesday, as well as megaliths. Well, unfortunately, being an island that um, has this precious Portland limestone, uh, a lot of it's been extracted, taken away, and a lot of the megalithic sites have been um, taken away and preserved in the walls. Um, just around the corner from here, I also noticed that even the uh, 19th century, no, late, early 20th century bridge has incredible stone workmanship. Um, and it's, there's no mortar in it. It's dry stone walling to its most magnificent. And this is just a railway bridge uh, on the quarry called Tout Quarry. I, I chose this photograph because um, it's covered in ivy at the moment, so you can't see it so well. Um, and I, the more I kept looking around Portland, the more I kept seeing this magnificent stonework, including Rufus Castle. And Rufus Castle is unusual. It's five-sided. It's a pentagonal castle. And nobody seems to know exactly when it was built. Uh, the name Rufus might be an indication. But um, it had an early name called Giant's Castle. And uh, Portland seems to have this reoccurrence of five giants, Phoenicians, uh, and temples to Venus, uh, and Freemasonry. And to most people, it's all separate and under, underneath everything on Portland. But uh, I came along and started to drag it all out, which upset a lot of local people. Um, Inside Rufus Castle, you can still see some of the magnificent dry stone masonry in the Cyclopean fashion. 
um, with hardly any mortar use at all. In fact, any mortar that you do see was probably no, uh, 20th century restoration. So uh, the more I researched on Portland, the more I realised there's, um, there's a legacy here, because the Portlanders were their own people. They, they never left the island up until the 19th century. Uh, most of them were put on the island by, by kings um, to keep the trade going independent of the politics of the mainland. So um, basically, it was an isle of trade uh, for, many, for a long time. And then in the 19th century, it became a, an island of um, quarrying, if you like, um, <clears throat> because London, was, um, London used um, Portland Stone to uh, recreate the, the inner city of London after the Great Fire. So um, Portland became famous then for its stone. But um, it was still a, past, a pastoral paradise um, right up to the 19th century. Uh, they were only taking stones from the cliff. But as soon as they, they um, built a railway bridge across and a road bridge, they started to quarry from the inside of the island and the plateau of the island. And that took away a lot of the ancient monuments of which they, uh, the early 19th century antiquarians said there were many. Uh, and it's almost, it was a bit of a megalithic paradise on top of Portland, with over seven stone circles, megalithic um, uh, settings, barrows, tumuli, you name it, like, and stone rows as well. So if we um, look at Portland in context, you can see Portland there jutting out into the channel, uh, connected by the great Chesil Beach, um, tombola of um, flint, um, which the locals call chert. And um, in red, marked near the top, is the area of Dorchester. Now, Dorchester, well, you know, Dorset is the hidden county, and there's a lot hidden in Dorset. Um, especially during the 16th, 17th, 18th century, a lot was concreted over. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting sites around Dorchester that really haven't been aired, unlike Stonehenge and Avebury. Um, underneath the streets of Dorchester is a whole megalithic complex, of three henges. Um, <clears throat> one, the Great Dorchester Henge was probably the largest. Um, I've got a picture of it here. Uh, this was a great timber circle, and um, it measured over 380 metres uh, in diameter, uh, which compares to 420 with Avebury. So it was a very large monument. Um, and a little bit further out from Dorchester, a little a mile away, is Mount Pleasant, which again was another 370 metre diameter henge monument. This time it had wooden posts um, in, in concentric circles from the middle. So it was rather like a giant wood henge. Off one of the henges, you can see the, this, the, um, the um, postmarks in the black. The other henge um, is still visible, is Mornbury Rings, which is in the middle of Dorchester. Uh, this the Romans turned into an amphitheater, but it's really a Neolithic henge with an entrance facing just off north, as if it marked this sort of um, setting of Cygnus. So Dorchester itself, and it's still a great meeting place today, Mornby Rings, and they, they celebrate um, sort of little, little festivals and fairs in the Henge today. So there's a, a legacy of, of, meet, uh, of it being a great meeting place. Also, there's, um, there's Hardy's house, Max Gate. People know Thomas Hardy, the great um, or, um, writer. Well, he built his house right in the middle of a stone circle. His house here is in red, and the circle is in the black ring. Uh, it's no wonder he could write well. He was getting lots of vibes from inside his own circle. Uh, he found some of the um, megaliths in his garden and erected them and um, kind of worshipped them, if you like, or honoured them as altars. So and Hardy was a bit of a megalithomaniac, I reckon. Hardy was also very interested in Portland. He felt that um, the Portlanders were the most interesting race of people because they kept themselves distinct from the mainland peoples. They had their own culture, 
They had their own laws. Um, the kings gave them their own parliament uh, and governing body called the court leet. So they were independent from the king and the, and the politics of the mainland. Um, and they consisted of about five or six different races. Uh, the earliest said to be Phoenician, as Huguenots. Um, there were Celts from Ireland, um, called Pierces. The Combans were the, the Phoenicians. Uh, stone, Lano, were all stonemasons brought into the island from different areas of Europe. Um, and here you see that the top of Portland is distinct from the lower parts, and it had once uh, an earthwork around it, like um, a defensive ditch and bank earthwork, um, running right around the top of the island. I've sort of marked it in the yellow. There's nothing much to see today because a lot of the quarrying has taken that away. But Hardy maintained there was a temple to Venus on the island, uh, lead, on the road leading up to the plateau, which we reckon now is Priory Corner. Um, and that chapel disappeared a long time ago in a landfall, which um, Portland is a massive wedge of limestone on top of um, a layer of sand. So it's very unstable. And in the past, it's had cataclysms and tsunamis that have, that have buried and destroyed a lot of its monuments. Now here's an, uh, an, a 1790 print by Samuel Grimm that shows these uh, double-banked earthworks that separated the plateau from the, un from the, the um, separated top hill from underhill. Underhill is the name of the people that live below the plateau and top hill people on top of the plateau. And they're, they're, again, they were distinct peoples who kept themselves separate. And hardly anybody visited the mainland. They, had, um, they, had, they were self-sufficient self people. You can see a hill fort uh, behind there as well. But if you walk around the streets of Portland, occasionally you'll come across megaliths in the wall. Now, you megalithomaniacs understand about megaliths. You know a megalith when you see one. You, you know that there's weathering um, and that, that, uh, that, that it's been worn standing and not lying down. So, and these are the sort of stones I've found around Portland, but in only in certain areas, on certain roads. And I think one day I went to the museum um, library and I had to go to the reception to get the key. And one day there was a different lady there, a young lady, who's not normally there, and she said, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm just doing some research on Portland. And she said, um, oh, well, have you looked at, in the cellar, and looked at the, um, the files in the cellar? I said, no, I didn't even know there was a cellar. And she said, well, come with me. So I went down in the cellar with this lady, and um, we got these old boxes out, covered in dust, and I found these manuscripts written by these old ladies who lived on Portland uh, from dating from about 1790 to 1920. And these are all memoirs um, which were published by Rodney Legg um, later on. But um, they talk about the stones uh, having these magical powers and how some of the circles were aligned with others. And I was reading sort of this information dating back before Alfred Watkins of alignments and megaliths, which was fantastic. So I thought, I've got to write about this. So... That started my quest of the spirit of Portland, the first book on Portland. And this book now goes into more of the legacy of those early Portlanders. But uh, some of the stones, as you say, are quite magnificent. There's at least seven stone features. Uh, five of them were definite circles. And again, um, we come up with the number five. And um, there's an old map I found only recently because the greatest of the circles on Portland was called the Frolic. And the Frolic was said to be a double-ringed, henge-like circle with massive stones, according to the antiquarians who, who visited the site. But it was thought to be at the end of Grove Road, um, and nobody's actually found out where the stones have gone. But recently I found an old uh, map um, in a book uh, about quarries and the stones of London and saw that the frolic is marked on this map. Um, it's very small, but it's, it says little writing frolic. I'll see if I can put it here. There it is, there. 
And there's one stone, there's one stone, there's another stone. There's not much left of it. But thankfully, Samuel Grimm um, actually caught um, somebody taking one of the stones away in a cart. <laughs> That's a horse and cart with a big stone on the back. And there's two of the massive stones of the circle. So he was like, not caught on camera, but caught on canvas, pinching the stones of Portland. So Portland had at least seven circles, as I was saying. Some might have been can circles, but the biggest one was the Frolic, which is just by in most hay quarry, in the middle of the island there. Um, and interestingly enough, most of the circles are around the high part of the island, not in the lower part. So in the, in the sort of thickest, because Portland's like a wedge, uh, its highest is, is at the northern side, and it gradually slopes down to the sea. Um, and a lot of the, the megaliths are on that high part of the island. On the cliffs, very close to two of the circles, is this face or giant's head as some people call it. And it was known as, uh, as Nicodemus's Knoll, the hill. It's interesting that uh, Nicodemus was in possession of a card head of Jesus, which was very lifelike. Um, so maybe they called it Nicodemus because the head reminded them. And remember, these are stonemasons, so they had all their own belief systems. Um, but giants, you know, there's giant tales all over the island. Giants were supposed to uh, throw stones across to... Uh, to Portisham. Um, why is it giants are always throwing stones? Don't they know it's dangerous? And why do they keep dropping them? Are they clumsy or what? But um, yeah, giants are all over Portland. Um, the Giants Castle. We've got um, quarry workers who, um, who, who mentioned that, uh, that some of the bones that they dug up in the quarries were of giants. They could have easily been mammoths. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, they, they supposedly found 12-foot 12 12 long coffins carved out of a single block of stone. Um, but were broken up, of course, and only the small ones are left. And there's only a couple left in the Portland Museum. But um, who knows whether that's true or not. Nevertheless, the stories of giants seem to go with the number five and go with big masonry, as you'll probably find out in a minute. The geology of Portland is quite interesting because it is a, a limestone sandwich um, with a sort of uh, rubble on top. Uh, in, inside the sandwich, there is layers of flint, black flint, as you can see the stripes there. And that flint's um, highly paramagnetic highly crystalline, and it's squashed an immense weight of the stone above it, creating almost like a battery of energy. Um, and Portland, as you can see from the shape of it, its highest point is to the north, and most of the stone circles are um, on this side, between there and there. Portland Museum has an exhibition that shows some of these unusual beehive chambers that were found during quarrying. Unfortunately, none have survived, and there's only a photograph of one because the quarry, make, the quarry workers on the island rule the island, basically. They are, they've bought all the land, they're allowed to dig it, and they, they don't really stop if there's anything worthwhile for the archaeologist um, because it will hold up the delay for the demand for the wonderful Portland stone that uh, is used now to um, reface a, a wearing London. But here we have the, these little beehive cells, if you like. Them, them, I think cells is a more accurate word for them. Um, interesting is some of them were together side by side, linked by passages. Some were, on a, um, were buried at least 30 feet down um, in rubble. But the archaeologist who did work on one of them back in the 19th century um, realized that most of them were on some kind of land surface that was later covered in rubble. And, and, all, and these beehive cells were preserved. So 
the general idea is that these are underground chambers. Well, they are now, but they weren't when they were built. Uh, archaeologists have found inside these little chambers all kinds of, of artifacts, some dating back to the Bronze Age. So they could be anything from 2,000 to 3,000 years old more likely to have come from the, the, the Iron Age period because across Europe um, you find these cells in Greece, they are the Thollus tombs. But in Ireland they are this sort of beehive cells that we find in monastic places like Skellig Michael, which is, you see to the right there. And they're, they're the beehive uh, cells in Ireland. And these are the beehive cells in Greece um, the greatest of which, of course, is the, the tomb of a, a treasury of Atreus, uh, which I th I'm sure Hugh Newman's been there a few times. It's one of the greatest megalithic structures in my book, anyway. And whether it, that was once a freestanding structure covered over by some kind of cataclysm, who knows. The same with the Portland coffins. The Portland coffins are made out of solid pieces of stone, carved out inside and out, uh, and they found over 150 of them on Portland, up on, mainly up on the Verne where the prison is today. And um, they were buried deep, and they shouldn't have been because the same types of coughing are found um, in, in the Etruscan lands, and they, they stand on the surface as sarcophagi, if you like. So what, what, why were these buried deep um, is, a, is another mystery, but then why were the beehives buried on a kind of old land surface? It, it just shows that something had happened on Portland. Um, and of course the Portlanders keep their history to their race, and so the, the Portland Traditions, which was written down by one of those ladies who wrote this unpublished manuscript that I found in the library, she said that the Portlanders remembered several cataclysms where the seas overwhelmed the island, uh, uh, and a lot of um, silt and sand and rubble just covered the island, and then the sea pushed it down and squashed it, so it became stone. There's another story I'll tell you later uh, concerning that. But you can see the, the similarity here to the Etruscan sarcophagi and the Portland. And the, these coffins in Etruria um, were actually wealthy, tra belonged to wealthy traders. Uh, at the time, probably the sort of the latter, uh, the sort of survivors of the Phoenicians. Now, I think some of that um, skill uh, of stone masonry and carving has gone into <clears throat> Portland's more modern buildings, including, um, which I think is one of the wonders of Portland, uh, is the altar screen in this church in the Square Eastern. This is the Eastern Methodist Church. Uh, inside, there's um, a solid piece of um, massive block of Portland stone carved uh, in this relief of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. Not anybody else's Last Supper, Leo, <laughs> um, yeah, Leo, Leonardo's Last Supper. So um, it, it fascinated me that with a, with a hand and chisel, um, with, a, with a hammer and chisel, they, they cut out this incredible likeness. Um, it is a masterpiece of the of stonemason's art. And this, this was one of the many unusual things you find in Portland churches. Uh, the other ones in the now parish church of All Saints. Uh, the first time I went into this church um, looking for its history, I noticed the ceiling above the uh, altar. And it had the 12 signs of the zodiac on it. And I said to the vicar, I said, that's what's the signs of the Zodiac doing in a Christian church? I said, it's not part of Christian belief system, is it? And he said, no, it's, um, it's actually the 12 beasts of the apocalypse. I said, no, no. I said, look, I says, I says, that there is a scorpion with his stinger at the back and, and that there is, is Sagittarius and blah, blah. And, and he said, no, 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 it's the 12 beasts of the apocalypse. He said, anyway, he said, um, they were painted by Oxford students. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, it's in the guidebook. So I picked up a guidebook. There's this story that the first vicar of the church wanted to create something uh, to beautify the altar area. So he hired these Oxford students to paint the 12 beasts of the apocalypse. But instead, they painted the 12 signs of the zodiac. 
likely story. But it's also the 12 steps of the Freemasons, remember? And Freemasonry is, seems to be very strong in Portland because of the links with working with stone. Stonemasons, uh, not the kind of Freemason stuff, it's more the kind of stonemason knowledge that uh, was filtered, filtered uh, which filtered into stone, uh, Freemasonry. But it all started with, some say Wren on the island, but it went long before that. Wren had an influence on St. George's Church in the island. This is an unusual looking church. It looks a little like a miniature St. Paul's Cathedral tower um, with this very um, austere sort of triangular blocked uh, building with a, with a sort of stunted dome in the middle. But when you, um, when you look at the geometry of it, and this is really observing, I'm being an observer, I sort of look at it and I think, there's something special about this building. And because it replaced the old church, uh, St. Andrew's, which was the only one in the island, um, it's, it must have inherited a lot of the old knowledge, and the, including megalithic knowledge. So I got a, managed to get an accurate plan of the church, and I, I drew out this and discovered it has the perfect vesica geometry. Absolutely perfect. Every part of it fitted. Uh, in fact, you can, you can get... Um, seven circles along the axis of the church in perfectly fitting, so like uh, the vesica chain, seven, seven vesica chain across. Now, I thought, well, where does this knowledge come from? Has the court leak got anything to do with it? The court leak is the governing body. And even today, they're still a bit mysterious and don't really like to talk. Um, and when I've had interviews with them, they were quite sharp with me. So I sort of looked into all this and discovered that um, they had meeting places around the island. Uh, one of them was St. George's Inn. And St. George's Inn has this court leak room. Uh, it might be one of the places we could visit on Wednesday because it, those of you who love symbolism and mystery might find a few things. Because just out of the door from the court leak chamber is this symbol on the floor. Nobody yet has been able to decipher what it means. I've put it up on the Facebook page. Um, but uh, some say it's a map of the sort of faults of the island. But uh, a lot of people say, well, haven't you noticed those stones are covering something? That there's a chamber under there. And that, that was an entrance to an underground crypt of some kind where they, they did their sort of ceremonies. So I thought, well, that's interesting, but... And I discovered that other places where the court the met conformed to geometry in the island. Um, so it got more and more interesting the more and more I looked into and observed and felt and sensed. One of the great tales I love, I found this recently, it's in the new book called Mysterious Portland. Um, it's the Greek coins that were found. Uh, we all know William Stukely, or Stukely, who, who um, was a great antiquarian who loved, he was passionate about um, megalithic sites. He was almost, for some people, a god of the megaliths. And he was invited to Portland to look at some of the finds there. Um, and it was Lord Pembroke who showed him the huge amount of coins that were found at a very low level in one of the quarries. Um, the geologist at the time reckoned it came out of a layer of 2000 BC, or around that time. And he'd found all these um, coins, hatfuls of them, he, he described them as. Most of them were silver, but many of them were gold. And Lord Pembroke um, basically melted them all down into bars, which is typical of, of what goes on in Portland and most of the other archaeology in Dorset. I've met quite a few people who have admitted to melting down objects that could have been Phoenician or Egyptian. Dorset was known as Little Egypt by the old people because so many faience beads were found, faience beads were found in the barrows. Though, uh, there's a, and lots of psychic people have also feel drawn to Dorset and something about it, and this Egyptian connection. It's another, another story, another book. So what are Phoenician coins doing in Portland? Why were they so found so deep in the quarries? It's possible that 
that was the old land surface, and the great tsunamis that covered the island with silt and compressed down with the water became rock very quickly. So you're seeing what looks like geological layers, but actually it's more recent, and that's where geology can throw us off a bit in our research. <clears throat> now, the island is divided up in ancient times into eight great fields around five towns. Eight and five. Interesting numbers. Five again. Five towns. This is on Top Hill, by the way, not, not counting Underhill. So, and again, that, that number kept coming up with the five-sided Rufus Castle, 55 steps leading down to St. Andrew's Church, the only church on the island, which, is, um, which was a ruin by the sort of uh, 18th century. And um, when Wren was working on the quarry, working with the quarries, um, policing sort of the work of the quarries, he, he got very friendly with the um, Gilberts, who were the master masons of the island, and it's possible that it, they would have discussed with him a new church because already the church was starting to crumble uh, and the cliffs were eroding and the graveyard was disappearing fast. So they decided to abandon the church. But it was a big shame to the Portlanders because this church was supposed to be the centre of the island at one time. And that the great cataclysms and tsunamis caused it to be on the coast according to their um, myths and legends. Uh, also, Rufus Castle was supposed to stand in the middle of the island, which you can see behind it there. But um, archaeologists discovered Iron Age coins uh, in the foundations, and Saxon and Norman, so there's a site continuance here going back a long, long way. And the Portlanders maintain it was a, a temple to Venus originally, and whether that means a stone circle, or an Iron Age temple, or a Masonic temple, I don't know. But I started to look at the relationship between St. Andrew's Church and St. George's Church, uh, the one that replaced it, the one you just saw in the last slide with the vesica geometry. I discovered, amazingly, that if you stand uh, at the Tower of St. George's and look towards the Church of St. Andrew's, it's the exact line of the of the winter solstice sunrise. So they, they placed it as exactly the right degrees on a solar line. So I thought this is interesting because St. Andrews is halfway down a cliff. You can't see it from St. George's. But there, somehow they'd worked the geometry out, right? Um, and, and then I started to realize that the distance between St. Andrews Church and St. George's Church was the same distance as from there to many other churches. In fact, there's five churches that are equidistant from each other. And it's it taken me a while to find the measure. And thankfully, Robin Heath over there helped um, me sort of, um, inspired me, I guess, to sort of um, knuckle down to it and see if I can find a really accurate measure. And um, I did find with the most, the most accurate Google Earth from the web Google Earth, which is, you know, in your file from your standard downloading Google Earth, and go into the web Google Earth, it's more accurate measure. So I, first of all, I tested the Google Earth measure by measuring the church of St. Andrews, because its, it's profile is still much there, the foundation's there, you can measure it still. And I measured it 125 feet long, and then I got the Google Earth, uh, the decent Google Earth out, and that came also to 225 feet, so I thought, well, that's pretty good. So then I looked at the distance between the churches, and it was 4,500 feet. And I didn't know much about what that means, so I, I asked Robin, and we sort of came up with some, uh, with some measures that uh, it may correspond to, and certainly ancient measures. Uh, 3,000 cubits is 4,500 feet. But uh, the short cubit, not the royal cubit or the long cubit, um, which uh, normally architecture and temples are built with the long cubit or the royal cubit. So um, this was actually a short cubit measure. So I thought, so maybe the 3,000 cubit is the thing I should be looking for. Well, it's mentioned in the Old Testament a number of times, that measure, 3,000 cubits, to do with measures of temples and courtyards. Um, and... Interestingly, of the, the Isle of Tyre, the great Phoenician port, um, used that measure in its, um, in its 
uh, port and, um, and its temples. So um, I, that got me quite interested, but um, it, a bit minefield, it is a bit of a minefield with measures. So, and I looked at all kinds of um, possibilities, that maybe a Byzantine short mile, because there's a short mile and a long mile, uh, all to do with, with, this, with the uh, circumference of the earth, and, um, which John Michel um, articulates amazingly. Um, so I, that I was saved from, it, from all this sort of uh, uh, measure and number and ratio by another manuscript that I'd found in the Portland Museum that I was sort of, I'd overlooked before. And this one was about a guy who, who uh, looked into the measure of everything on Portland. And he said that the Portlanders had their own measure. And, and this measure was um, a Portland yard, he called it. It was four and a half feet. Uh, and that is a long yard. So yard's normally about three feet. This is a, a giant yard for a giant race of people, no doubt. Um, but, but then it, it sort of triggered me, hold on, four and a half feet, that's just, so a thousand Portland yards is the distance between the churches. You can't get a rounder number than a thousand Portland yards. So obviously the Portlanders had their own measure. And was this measure an ancient measure? Was it something they developed within their own race? This is something I looked into. <clears throat> you can see that um, the, the, the circle made between St. Andrews and St. George's, this 4,500 feet diameter circle, or 9,000 feet, sorry, uh, <clears throat> 9,000 feet uh, diameter um, um, and 4,000 feet radius circle, uh, is, um, relates to the measure of the island in its most southerly and northerly tips. And uh, all this got very interesting. I've not got time to go into all the numbers and measure at this moment, but it all developed into a Vesica Piscis, um, and it related to many of the churches. And it, it sort of come out, comes out to a Portland eye, I called it, like the Masonic eye. And there's me sort of measuring St. Andrew's Church with a good old-fashioned measure to look into... Um, if they used a special measure in the actual church. Because St. Andrew's Church is on a sacred place and it kept the dimensions of the previous churches, maybe it's a special measure. So it came to 125 feet, which is a 36th of the 4,000 foot measure between the churches. And 36 is like a pentagonal number. Um, it's the sort of ratio of a, of a, of a pentacle. Um, so... I suddenly looked at that measure and thought about Wren and the people who owned this land because the Penn family owned St. Andrew's Church for many, many centuries uh, until recently. And um, the church itself goes back to Benedictine times and probably before. Uh, so I looked at London and because St. George's represents kind of Wren's church, and the knowledge, and the person, Gilbert, um, who actually built the church, was a student of Wren's School of London. I wondered if there's some interesting correlations in London. So I looked at the old St. Paul's Cathedral and put a measure from the high altar of today's St. Paul's Cathedral and saw if there's anything 4,500 feet out from there. And uh, it, one church in, uh, came to, um, had hit the measure perfectly, and that was the um, All Hallows by the Tower. And this church has real history going back to Roman times. Uh, there's Roman remains in the, in the crypt. And it has a separate tower, just like St. Andrew's has a separate tower. Um, and I thought it's interesting because when I started to look into the history, um, the Penn family have a lot to do with this church. And it was the Penns who owned St. Andrew's Church and built their own Pennsylvania castle above it. Uh, the Penns uh, were married in this church. Uh, one great, uh, um, William Penn actually saved the church from the fire of London. So that they've got a real um, history with this church. And when I sort of took the 4,500 foot line up, it came to a, a very old priory, it's no longer there, at Oldgate, called the Holy Trinity Priory. And this was one of the first uh, established uh, religious houses inside the walls of London after the Norman Conquest. So it, this also had a great history, and then when I put it all together, um, 
I came, it came to, the, um, to this interesting triangle, an isosceles triangle, um, linking the London Stone and many other places, Royal Exchange. Um, and I was thinking that uh, this is something I'm developing, and I found it on the other side as well. So those megalithomaniacs out there, think about 4,500 feet, you might find something interesting. But what does it all relate to? And, you know, the, the, on Portland, there are six Masonic lodges. It's a tiny island. Even Bristol has only got two lodges. You know, so Portland's a little island, two and a half miles by three quarters of miles. It's got six Masonic lodges. And that is probably an indication of what's going on um, so, uh, underground, if you like, or a kind of underground stream of knowledge that's on Portland. These pillars were erected around the millennium, said to mark the millennium, but actually they were put up long after. Uh, and they're also said to be beacons, which they aren't, and they're supposed to celebrate the Queen's Jubilee, which they didn't. Uh, and if, if you go to the pillar, park your car and, and actually walk to them, you'll see on the pillar it celebrates the six Masonic lodges on Portland. These are two pillars of Freemasonry. So when I stood between these two pillars, looking up at Portland, I noticed there was another pillar in between, um, on the in middle of the island, and uh, it's called the Tower Stone, and it commemorates the Tower of London, uh, which I thought was really interesting, very really strange. There's the Tower Stone, and there's the pillars behind. So, in Freemasonry, the middle pillar is, is, is an important pillar. It relates to Venus. It relates to the Shekinah. It relates to the sort of Holy Trinity. It relates to the... Um, to um, the sort of hidden knowledge. And I followed a line, so I thought I'd, drew, I'd draw a line through on Google Earth from the middle of those pillars through that tower stone, see where it goes. And, and it, it went straight through um, really interesting churches. That The church with the zodiac uh, didn't just go through the end of the church, it went right underneath the zodiac of the masons. Um, also goes through the site of that, the largest stone circle called the Frolic, as you can see, Portland's a really weird place. <laughs> and even talking about it makes things go mad. Uh, this has happened before with lots of things to do in Portland, especially Freemasonry. And, and the, this, it's like talking about the middle pillar and Venus. It, it um, all goes crazy. But there is actually a group of people um, on Portland want to keep Portland weird. And uh, it certainly is that. What I discovered that the Isle of Tyre is a, a mirror of the Isle of Portland, and it had two harbours exactly the same, um, north and south. And its main temple of Tyre, the Phoenician temple um, to Astarte, the goddess of Venus, was exactly, uh, if we lay, laid it over Portland, where this temple of Venus was that hard, he said. And um, Portlanders have always maintained that they had this connection with Tyre. And, um, and it's possible that there was a colony of Phoenicians settled on Portland. And they were worshippers of Venus and brought that knowledge of Venus with them. Um, and the five and the eight is all to do with Venus because the eight-year cycle of Venus, um, it creates the pattern of a, of a five-petaled rose in the heavens. So five and eight are uh, integral numbers. And recently, I managed to um, discover that there is a temple um, underneath Rufus Castle. It was thought to be a, a water sort of um, cistern or a cave of some kind, but there are great megalithic blocks. And uh, if, if it was on the screen now, you'd see this wonderful temple um, of, of these uh, great blocks. Uh, interestingly, when you get inside of it, it's a five-sided chamber with five pillars in it. So I, I thought, well, this, this is an indicator. And it's facing east towards um, probably um, a Venus would rise before the sun at the equinox. And often that was a, a, something key to a lot of churches and temples, like Rosalind Chapel, was built to, to capture the light of Venus at the equinox before uh, the sun rises. So, and this seemed to be a key thing with Masonic temples as well. And the third degree... Um, the third degree in the ceremony was all about 
um, looking up and capturing the light of, of Venus, which is the light of rebirth. So basically the light of Venus was, 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 is linked with rebirth. Um, and we all know now that Venus is rather a new planet that uh, was birthed in our solar system and settled down to its uh, rotation at the moment, but at one time caused a lot of disasters <laughs> on the Earth, as um, some of you may know. Ah, look. The, this, the Temple to Venus, you can see the blocks um, and the five pillars inside. And it's, it's exactly 55 steps from Rufus Castle, the five-sided castle. So there's all this connection here with the Phoenicians. How long have I got, by the way? Ten minutes? Yeah. So I want to take you a little bit further along the cliffs to um, another temple. Some of you may know it as St. Oldham's Chapel, also known as St. Alban's Chapel, on St. Alban's Head, or St. Oldham's Head. It has two names, typical of Freemasonry. St. Alban is a hero to he Freemasons because he was supposed to have brought Freemasonry to, to Britain. So the name Alban is linked with Freemasonry. And so and this chapel was built by Freemasons uh, or quarry workers, stonemasons more likely. Um, going back to Romanesque times, uh, the earliest castle that was built at Corfe Castle, the Masons worked in the quarries here, built their own chapel. It's called the Devil's Chapel. What kind of service goes on in there, I wonder? Is it a place for, your, uh, for, for to, to save your souls or to have them taken? <laughs> now, the, the chapel is interesting. It's, it's 32 foot square. It has one central pillar, a pyramid roof, and only one narrow slit window and an entrance. So there it is, perfectly square set inside a henge with this narrow slit window, as you can see from the bottom here. There's the window, just a narrow slit. In order to let a certain light in. <laughs> and here we see the, the middle pillar. It's like a great tree of life. Anybody seen a church like this anywhere on your travels? No, you won't. It's an unusual one. It, I reckon it probably dates to about 10-something because the earliest castle built by the... Uh, in fact, Corfe Castle is what... The earliest Corfe Castle is one of the earliest stone-built castles in the, in the country. And the masons who built it were obviously extra special, and these are the ones who built this chapel. Uh, you can see the slit window. Um, and that, that window lights up the central pillar, a particular hole. Like you find cathedrals have a certain window that lights a particular place up, or Roslyn Chapel shines a red light on a certain spot. This one shines a light on the central pillar at a hole. And this hole um, was, was where young maidens would put offerings for a husband, wishing for a husband. It's like a, a, a kind of an area of an oracle, if you like, a goddess oracle. Uh, lots of chapels along the coast of Dorset dedicated to St. Catherine, or Cuthra, which was a Phoenician goddess. Um, interestingly, that uh, this chapel has a central pillar, which was an oracle for the maidens, the central pillar being the Shekinah, the female pillar. It was all very, very Freemasonic, very interesting, all to do with the light of Venus, and a lot of the like low mass and uh, a lot of the other authors have come to this conclusion that Freemasonry is more about astrology than anything else. And something about the light of Venus and rebirth is very important. Uh, and to capture that light was for them magical, as if it opened a doorway. And, and this is something we discovered in the Roslyn Chapel information, our new book, about opening doorways. Not getting in a rocket and going off to another planet, but actually stepping through into a, a, a multiverse, uh, another reality, a, a, another timeline, perhaps. And I've, uh, I, know, I'm, I know I'm crazy, uh, and I've met people who, who pretend to be crazy, and, and they are crazy. And I've met people who have actually been through 
to these uh, parallel worlds briefly, but come back in time. I'm sure some of you know or have heard stories of people um, suddenly in a different land um, and then coming back. Uh, obviously, they had to come back, otherwise they wouldn't be telling you. But um, it, it's possible that the Freemasons understood this concept, certainly the Phoenicians, and they built these temples as doorways. Um, and so that's what it looks like today, St. Alden's Chapel. It's very difficult to get to. You couldn't, you'd have to walk, you have to walk for about two, two and a half miles from the nearest car park if it's not full to get to it. It's really tricky, but it's worth going to one day if you're ever around. And I think my time's almost up, so I'll end. A lot of that information's in my new book, which is on sale down below. Um, so, yep, all I'm going to say is that um, somebody once said to me, um, I think it was on a program not long ago, that um, you shouldn't believe everything you hear and only half of what you see. And I think that that's true with, with Portland. It's, um, what you actually see doesn't relate to how you feel. And sacred landscapes are like that for us. So thanks for listening, and thanks very much.